Welcome to Fresh Off the Boat. My name is Arjun Seth, and I run Edbrand. It's an education consulting services company based in New Delhi and Gurgaon. Uh, today, I'm delighted to be uh, chatting with Rohan Nakpal, a student I've known since 2011-12, and he was at DPS Arkipuram, and then graduated to go to Harvey Mudd College to study engineering. And we'll know how his plans shaped up, and he ended up doing uh, economics and mathematics uh, at the Claremont Colleges. So uh, Rohan, I know yours is a uh, not a straight line path as a career <laughs> trajectory, and it'll be interesting. So welcome. Welcome to our podcast. Thank and you. Good to know your story. Uh, I would uh, want you to uh, first tell us about your early days at Claremont and what do you think uh, was like settling in at Harvey Mudd? Um, so settling in at Harvey Mudd was fairly straightforward. and uh there weren't too many frictions per se from adjusting to say social life or adjusting to the environment per se but i'd say um there were there were a lot of frictions in terms of adjusting academically um it was a level of academic rigor or that i wasn't a i wasn't used to and b i don't think i expected um, I think I got th I got by fairly easily in terms of uh, in terms of the physics, chemistry, math that I did through eleventh and twelfth grade. Uh, but there was a slightly just I mean there is a there is a nuanced shift in terms of how the American system is different, uh, which took a little bit of time to get used to. Um, and I think the other thing that made it particularly hard was that mud isn't just mud is rigorous and that probably works if you're doing four courses a semester which is a standard course load including at the claremont colleges but mud sort of pushes you to do five six courses a semester semester after semester so um i think the biggest the biggest thing that the, uh, the biggest adjustment i had to make and the one that took me a fair amount of time was the sort of course load in combination with the academic rigor so that took a little bit of time to get used to. But apart from that, I think there wasn't there weren't too many issues getting settled in. Fantastic. So I think let's address the elephant in the room right away. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really about uh, knowing that whether you have the engineering mindset or not. And I think uh, you have some interesting things to share while we are talking prior prior to this call. Right. So I think engineering is at least when we see engineer. The perception that we have of engineering in India is that everyone who is who meets some threshold of academic achievement or like perceived intelligence goes on to be an engineer or a doctor. Um, and overwhelmingly in, say, the last it, as I was graduating from school, uh, it was you do PCNC and then you go to engineering because you just you look at you look at people who are generally successful and they tend to be engineers. They fit this mold. Um, and then I was also interested in tech. Um, and the moment you're interested in tech, it seems like everything else falls away and you only see engineering as a path to doing that because everyone of note in tech tends to be an engineer. So I thought of it that way and I saw all of the nice shiny things. But <laughs> when I got the mud, I sort of saw how deep the trenches are in terms of engineering. <laughs> so. Um, it's not all fun and games. Uh, you will have to spend numerous hours on an evening just sit, hunched over, say, a circuit board, and then you're soldering wires. Um, and that didn't fit with my conception of what an engineer did. Uh, my conception of an engineer was like the public perception that perhaps Elon Musk has, where <laughs> he never talks about any of the, like his hands getting dirty bits, or he will talk about them in a very braggadocious manner. He won't talk about them in a sort of, uh, oh, this is really tedious, like look at what I have to do sense. So for me, engineering was none of the bad stuff and all of the good stuff. And when I got to mud, I realized that it was a lot of, it was <laughs> overwhelmingly the really, really tedious stuff. Uh, and then there were bits, bits of those, but you had to put in so much time and do all the tedious things so well to get the like nice shiny things at the end of it that uh, I don't know. I just I just tapped out very early. Um, right. But I'd say that does I'd say that doesn't just that's not restricted to engineering alone. I think that's true of ev that, that's true of most sciences because 
even in so <laughs> when I decided to not do engineering, I was like, okay, let's abstract away because I don't want to do all of this grimy stuff. So let's go to physics because that's what engineer is an engineer in just applied physics. Uh, <laughs> but what made me sort of weird away from physics was the fact that I had to spend five, four and a half, five hours every evening, one week, just in lab, meticulously aligning some pieces <laughs> of uh, experimental equipment to just get like the results that you're looking for. And these are really boring things, right? You're just sitting, you're sitting at a table and then you keep moving these plastic blocks like a centimeter at a time, hoping to see a change. And then you suddenly see like this spike in your reading. And then you're like, okay, now I have to go from moving it one centimeter at a time to moving it one millimeter at a time. So, uh, so there are there are a lot of these like tedious aspects to the sciences that I think people should be more aware of when they're thinking of doing the sciences. Well, that's a pretty honest answer. And I think uh, our listeners would appreciate that. And I, I'm having fun listening to you. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So about the shift, and of course mm. you're lucky that you're at a, at a, at a it's like a consortium of colleges with cross right. as possible. Uh, so what are the opportunities you sought? How did the advising work? Uh, and then finally, what changes did you make? Um. So I don't. So I think my <laughs> the first three years at college were just sort of spent trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not three, but like the first, the first four semesters, I had absolutely no idea. I was like, okay, engineering, no, okay, math, no, no, sorry, not even okay. math. So it was engineering, physics, and then math. And I was like, no, math is way too hard, even though there's none of the tedious stuff. Um, so that was, so that's, that entire journey took about what? All of my second, or, or the entirety of my two, of my first two years, and then half of my third year. <laughs> um, and then, what the reason why I sort of moved into economics was um, I'd always had this interest in sort of technology and I was a quizzer, so I ended up reading a lot. Um, and there was no quizzing in Camel. There is there is very strong quizzing culture in Delhi. It's also there at Ashoka, which I really enjoyed over the last two years. But um, there is no quizzing culture in Claremont or in the US per se. There is a little bit in the Bay Area, but that's all Indians who've come from your IITs and are now there. Um, so it's all of that. So there was no quizzing culture, but um, I tried to find an outlet for similar, for a similar setting. What I found in Claremont was the MUD Investment Fund, which is student run investment fund. You meet, you discuss stocks, you say, oh, this stock has potential, this stock doesn't, this is undervalued, overvalued. Um, and that sort of got me down this path, something that was complete coincidence, but it got me down this path where I was meeting people, thinking about, say, uh, very tangentially thinking about topics in finance um, and trying to think about what companies are worth or like they, they were broadly, they were, they were vaguely approaching financial econ. Um, so that was in the back of my mind. Um, I ended up taking a couple of econ electives. Um, and because I was affiliated with the Mud Investment Fund, I had the opportunity to pitch in a somewhat competitive setting. Um, and it just so happened that that pitch was sort of well received. So when you get positive feedback, you're sort of more likely to go down a certain path. Uh, so I was getting positive feedback in terms of pitches. So I was like, oh, this corporate finance stuff seems interesting. This valuation stuff seems interesting. And I was doing far better on my econ classes than I was at my mud classes. So I was sort of over those first, what, five semesters, I was gently being nudged in that direction somehow. Um, so just, I mean, A, I was blundering on one front. Uh, and then I was getting some positive feedback on the other. So. I happened to sort of stumble into the econ major. And it was, um, it, and that's something that I think would have been really hard outside of Claremont because Claremont, while it seems like it's competitive to get in, um, once you're there, I think everyone has enough trust in everyone else to be of a certain caliber that most opportunities are open. If you say you want to try something, people are very accommodating and welcoming and helping and willing to help you do certain things or engage in certain extracurricular activities. So once I decided that I was like, okay, I mean, none of this is anyways working. <laughs> this seems interesting. I want to make the switch. 
it was fairly straightforward. Like I could approach the I could approach the chair of the econ department at CMC, get into conversations with him. He was like, yeah, yeah I'll sign off on everything. Um, at MUD, it was fairly straightforward to go from like a MUD major to a MUD minor. Um, and even at Pomona, so I was taking a class at Pomona and it was really nice uh, Pakistani professor who's been teaching at Pomona for a really long time. So there was anyways a little bit of a South Asian rapper that was there because he and his family would host certain events. Um, so I was also able to get in touch with him and he was able to connect me with people at Pomona to better understand what the options are. So um, in terms of guidance, it was I, I was very lucky. I think I really lucked out on that. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it sounds like a place where uh, students are given that freedom to make those choices. So uh, of course, knowing you, I was always uh, kind of interested to figure out why aren't you this uh, Elon Musk <laughs> already because uh, you know over the summers I would visit and um, your interest in doing internships and startups in the Bay Area so was it kind of continuation of your interest in business and in that investment club and what did you do during the summers um so during the summers um I'm there are a couple of alumni from my school who ended up working on a startup called Liga Panda. Um, it was fairly early stage. And because it was early stage, they had a vague notion of what they wanted. It was a consumer facing product. They wanted to build something that very pretentiously, the goal was to organize all of the world's knowledge, but Google already does that. So how do you carve out a niche for yourself? Um, and they, I mean, they had a fuzzy notion of what they wanted to do, um, and they were heading down that path. And I think the reason I ended up interning over there was I just built up a personal rapport with these people. Uh, so that sort of helped me get a foot in the door. It was really small. It was four people. Um, so I anyways had, an, like, I had, a, I had and continue to have an interest in sort of consumer technology, and they work in the space. So they're like, yeah, why don't you come down? And that's how like I ended up getting an internship over there. So I, I mean, yeah, that's basically how okay. I ended yeah, up. Yeah, super. So uh, what's, what's it like in the inside? Of course, you know, there's so much money in the Bay Area and a young college graduates uh, with a good degree can get funding. But what's the reality like? Um. So I will say that the reality that, or I won't call it reality. The perspective I got to see of the Bay Area was, I think, fairly unique, fairly sheltered, and uh, not representative at all of how it goes. Uh, because these people, um, it was they were, it was very like their real goal was fuzzily defined, to put it <laughs> to put it mildly, um, and most of the work I was doing was, it didn't seem like work. It seemed like, just go about your day. Uh, like, this is something I'm thinking about. <laughs> uh, why don't you also like try and figure out what your, th what your thoughts are on this and let's just, let's circle back and discuss these things. So not representative at all. I don't think I'll ever have another like job like that. They didn't pay me, but they took care of my living expenses, which is substantial in the Bay Area. Uh, but. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I yeah. don't think you can take this as <laughs> representative at all. <laughs> okay, no, that's fair enough. I think it makes sense. Um, so yes, uh, if you were to now look back and say, okay, you, you, you've come back to India. Also, you decided to do a few things, like, you know, and one of them was to apply to a master's program at Ashoka. Uh, yeah. What, and you've now completed it. It's been two years. Tell us a little bit about Ashoka and what you think of the Indian liberal arts college, sort of uh, mm -hmm. mushrooming of Indian liberal arts colleges. Uh, compare it with the academics, uh, not necessarily just undergrad, but in general, the vibe that you understood. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what did you really study? What happened? OK, so uh, I think my primary, we already went through how I sort of, I took a very non-linear path. <laughs> um, and, I only had three semesters to sort of wrap up my econ degree. Um, so at the end of it, I was still very fascinated by the field, but I felt like I had rushed through those three semesters and completing a major in three semesters, which people usually take four, I mean, eight semesters to do, 
uh, felt fairly rushed. So I wanted more time to immerse myself in the field. Uh, that was the primary motivation for going to Ashoka or seeking that option out once I got back. Um, academically, I think they're doing they're doing a fairly solid job in terms of um, delivering Western liberal arts style instruction. Um, I it's fairly inconsistent as uh, anything at the start could be. So there will be some professors who are really good and know how to sort of replicate that model really well because they themselves are steeped in the pedagogy. Uh, there are others who have who have been teaching at DU and ISI and um, right, DU ISI and what is the other place? Uh, BSC. Okay. Uh, that's the U, but yeah, okay. uh, so yeah, so people teaching at the U and ISI are coming, uh, have been doing this for many, many years. They're coming into a fresh environment. So if they've been doing it for say 30 years, there's obviously a certain degree of inertia and habit that builds up. So they're not, they're not translating that experience entirely. But that being said, I think most people do a fairly good job. Uh, the master's program is, I, I found it pretty good on some fronts. In some cases, it seemed like the introductory classes seemed a little bit like micro macro too, and you build up on that a little bit, but uh, there was that. I think they could do a little more in terms of pushing people to do data work um, and like go down into the trenches the way engineers go down into the trenches, the way physicists go down into the trenches in lab. Uh, they don't do enough of that with say econometrics or like numerical courses. Uh, I think they could do a little more of that. And I see hints of that in the US more than over here. But on the whole, I think they do a fairly decent job. It's it maybe maybe because I was taking four classes at Ashoka instead of six in, at MUD, I found it easier. Uh, but it seemed like the difficulty levels in terms of my upper level um, econ classes in Claremont sort of matched roughly uh, the difficulty level of Egon classes here. Uh, so yeah. Sure. What about opportunities though, in terms of internships and uh, research? Were um, they available okay. to students at Ashoka? Yeah, so I, I mean, most of the people I, so there were some people who had the chance to, in, to do RA positions under people at Ashoka. Um, Ashoka, before, up until my batch, so the, for the first two batches, had a tie-up with uh, the Poverty Action Lab at MIT. So roughly five to six in the first batch, maybe eight people got to intern with intern with JPAL over the summer and spend their third semester at JPAL doing an R ratio. So. Those opportunities were there. Uh, they're not there anymore, so I don't know how that changes. Um, a lot of people got the chance to intern with, or like RA under Professor Ashoka or, or your professor networks are fairly strong, so you can get recommended to other professors if you're doing RA ships. Um, I happen, I was, I, I, I got an RA position over the summer at, in Bombay at the RBI, uh, so that's what I ended up doing. Um, but yeah, I think there are enough positions if you want to be an academic. If you're looking at the master's program as a bridge to the corporate sector, I think that's a lot harder. Um, but yeah, so academic okay. positions, yes. Corporate sure. positions, maybe not. OK. And uh, yeah, so about the internship at RBI, was it a couple of months? or And what kind of work did it really involve? Oh, uh, data <laughs> in the church is looking, yeah. staring at my computer. Um, so it started off with a little bit of web scraping work. So pulling off, it was, so it was looking for any, um, so it's looking for hints of collusion within a network of financial defaulters. So amongst the people who defaulted on their loans, there were some who were, a judge to have defaulted willfully, the others like general matter, of course, like you, your business went under, you defaulted. Um, so what my, um, 
so the person I was, whose RA I was, uh, was interested in looking at whether there's any evidence of collusion between the people who are willfully defaulting on their loans. So are there people who have willfully defaulted on their loans and are people who know them like getting help and also more likely to default on their loans? Um, so that's what, that's the question he was interested in. And um, the first month or so was basically getting up to speed, pulling a lot of data from the internet, so writing scripts to pull, I mean, put together, say, a million row, a million observation data set and automating that entire process. Um, and then after that, I was just sort of cleaning it. So the same way, the tediousness that I described with engineering and with um, physics, you get that when you start doing data work and that's sort of cleaning the data. <laughs> so <laughs> you have a million rows, you need, by the time I was done cleaning, I was down to like 80,000 because there are a lot of duplications and all of that so the first the first month was spent doing that and then sort of figuring out how you can take this data and make it useful um so that uh that was an interesting experience i really enjoyed uh the opportunity that i got uh it has me a lot more interested in pursuing the option of a doctorate program maybe two years down the line a year down the line uh let's see how that goes because academia is going to shake up a fair bit after the pandemic uh, but there's that i yeah i really so typically you know this is an experience which sort of egged you to sort of maybe continue in say financial markets or banking in some sense but what are the other tracks or policy let's just say yeah policy. yeah right so typically that's what most of the economist sort of track students would do combine it mm -hmm. with policy yeah. Yeah, so moving forward, I'm gonna switch gears and ask you questions uh, which are rapid fire and get to know you a bit better. <laughs> okay. First things, during this pandemic, what are the one, two or three things you've done which have uh, made you reflect on life and what changes have you brought about or think that you should bring up? <laughs> <laughs> um, so honestly, the first, um, the first sort of, two months of the lockdown, I was uh -huh. just home and continuing with the show and trying to get things like bring all of those things to a close. So the first two months went by where I, I could have had a lot more time, but I just sort of wild away some of it. Some of it is just lost getting distracted by everything that's happening. Um, so is that, um, I'm not, I don't know if I have, if I've had any like substantial reflections, so to speak. Um, one thing that, I have been going back to though is uh, looking at say valuation or what I was doing at the Mud Investment Fund and the stock pitches that I was doing and sort of re and sort of going over those notes again because equity markets have been fairly volatile um, and it's sort of it just I don't know if it's just something that's moving a lot and therefore capturing my attention but. Um, I've just sort of I've been looking at those very seriously, and I've been re, I've been going over an online course that uh, goes over valuation. So that's the only thing that I've I'm doing differently, or I've reflected upon and got some time. So, uh, so tell, yeah. us, tell us about this course, as in what is it called, and even other things that you might be reading or have been inspired by, not necessarily in finance, but any influencers you follow, books that you've really authors that you admire. Okay, um, so this is this is a course by uh, this finance professor at NYU named Aswad Damodaran. Uh, so he's fairly well known. He's, I guess, he's one of the rock star academics, so to speak. Uh, so it's just his MBA course on valuation. So um, it goes over, it builds on a lot of the concepts I learned while doing corporate finance at CMC, um, and it goes one step further. And I hope I can start making some use of that information because um then i guess equity markets are going to move a lot moving forward so i can have some opinion there um on the other i mean i have been doing a fair amount of reading but uh over the last few uh weeks but i'm very i'm a very distracted person so i can't do one book at a time so i've been slowly making my way through uh two books at the moment uh, one is uh the third pillar by rajan uh, which kind of talks about how, or he builds with the idea that the markets and the state emerge out of society. Um, and 
the markets, the state and society form individual or the community form three pillars on which like the world is structured. But at this point, the community as a pillar is losing power and these other two are becoming more dominant. So it, it's, it traces the history of how these pillars developed and looks at what can be done moving forward. The second, this, the other book I've been reading in a fairly, at a fairly rapid clip is The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. Uh, it looks at modern monetary theory um, and is an introduction to it. It starts with the premise that government finances or like state, federal government finances, so the finances of the Indian state or the Indian budget and the American budget are not like household finances in that you don't have to make them balance because a sovereign entity can just print money and pay off their debts. Uh, it seems a little kooky to me. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, some of the suggestions make sense, but there are a lot of leaps in the middle. Uh, so I'm not, uh, so I'm just going through those two at the moment. Fantastic. It was so much fun listening to uh, all your experiences <laughs> and <laughs> even, um, you know, your the fact that now it seems that economics is something that you love and it's some, it's definitely showing in your interests as well. So thanks for short, sharing all of that and look Absolutely. forward to uh, inviting you to some of our panels, which we'll be organizing shortly. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. It was great talking to you, Arjun.